Okay, have you ever said these three words? Best day ever. Oh, man, I love it when I can say those words. You know, one of those days that you wish you could just carry that feeling on for the rest of your life. Maybe it was the day you got married. Maybe it was the day you had a baby. Um, Someone recently told me her best day ever was when uh, she just went into the waters of the Jordan River, River a couple weeks ago and was baptized. She said, I will never, never forget this experience. Maybe for you it was a milestone that was finally reached after so, so much work. Maybe it was the day the doctor said cancer-free. Maybe it was the day when a dream finally came true. Maybe it was when a long struggle was finally over. Some of you are experiencing that now as you struggle to rebuild, and, and it just seems like it just keeps going on and on and on. Your day will come. I've had a few of those experiences in my life, those best day ever. I... Um, savor the day my daughter was born. I, I remember the celebration the day my son's adoption papers finally came through. And then for some of us, we celebrate our grandchildren. Are they adorable? Okay. They hate it when I show these pictures. They're like in their late teens now. But I like the picture. Anyway, you know, it's just so much fun having grandkids. And then <laughs> then one of my favorite days was the day I graduated from a course of study at Duke, and I, I just, I was so happy, and I promised myself I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang on to this feeling forever, and, and my family and my friends were there, and they were proud of me. I was proud of me, and, and here's what we did. What we did was um, celebrate by going for a walk in the woods by the Eno River, and while we were walking, we saw a, a, a rope swing. And, and my grandsons were like, nah, I'm not going in there. And I was fully clothed. I grabbed that rope, and I launched myself into the river. And they're like, Gran, I said, get in here. We stayed the whole day, the entire day. And at the end of the day, we were muddy, and we had laughed, and, and we were exhausted in the best ways. And I was like, best day ever. Today we're going to continue in this story that we've been talking about for weeks. And in this Bible study, we, we talked a little bit about it last week, how, how the people, how the chosen people of God uh, were, were experiencing one of their best days ever. So the wall had been rebuilt, and what had happened was that for the first time in decades, in like seven, 70 years, the people could come together and worship without fear because the walls were in place. The, the city was being restored by this guy God had called to lead the charge called Nehemiah. You better know his name by now, right? We've been talking about him for a long time. And we're going to continue the story today um, because, again, the walls of the city have been rebuilt, and now God is, is working on rebuilding the people that lived within those walls. And um, last week we talked about this. They had gathered in this great big celebration to celebrate God's mercy, what he'd done, all the miracles, and mostly, mostly to celebrate what God was doing on the inside of their lives. To cap off this great celebration, we read this last week, their pastor Ezra came out and he had the Torah in his hands. And what happened? The place erupted. It was a massive celebration. Let's look at the scripture together. We read it last week. It's in Nehemiah 8, 5, and 6. Would you read it with me? Ezra stood on the platform in full view of all the people. When they saw him open the book, they all rose to their feet. Then Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, Amen, Amen, as they lifted their hands. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. 
Can you picture this? These are people who for decades had been beat down, living in the ruins, never hearing the word of God, never being able to gather to worship for fear that they are going to be attacked. And now they get to hear the word of God again, and God begins renewing them and restoring their vigor and their, their purpose and their passion. And they rediscovered that they are God's people, that they were the chosen people, and, and the Spirit was moving, and so much so that they're celebrating and they're shouting amen, and some of them are, are so overcome with gratitude that they, they can't even stand, and they fall on their faces before Almighty God. Now, when we have these kind of best days ever, you and I, where we're like, oh, thank you. We take pictures, right? We take pictures of everything. You got to see what happened. Let me show you what happened. I want to show you this picture. We try to get every detail, every nuance. That's how we preserve the memory of a big event. Have you seen any big events lately? Everybody is watching through their phone, right? All the big stuff. This is a small example of why the average iPhone user according to photo tutorial, has 2,100 photographs in their phone. How many do you have? Do you know? All right, as of Wednesday morning at 12.37 a.m., I had 4,000, exactly. And I'm saying, finally, I'm above average at something. Yay! I'm so excited. But I think this is actually, uh, could be an indicator that, that I have some joy in my life. And the reason I say that is, according to that same site, the statistics say that during the lockdown, which some of you may remember, that photography was down 25%. I mean, what were we going to take pictures of? How would we caption it? Here's me in my home alone. <laughs> oh, here's another one of me alone. There was no celebrations hardly going on. People weren't going out. Um, there was uh, nothing happening, right? And, and I will say, a lot of people took pictures of, of the Zoom meetings with everyone's faces. Oh, I'm so glad those days are over. I'm so glad those days are over. So when times are good, things change. There's more photographs being taken now, but I want you to go back to Nehemiah's day. No phones, no place to post pictures, for sure. No camera, no visual reminder of a big event, but they had a way to mark a big event to mark a best day of ever that they never, never, ever wanted to forget, to mark an event that they would cherish with their all and remember the rest of their lives. How they did that was by making a covenant. And that's exactly what happens near the end of Nehemiah's great celebration. The walls are rebuilt the people have a renewed sense of who they are, whose they are. And here's their response. Let's look at it on the screen. The people responded, in view of all of this, we are making a solemn promise and putting it in writing. On this sealed document are the names of our leaders and Levites and priests. The document was ratified and sealed with the following names. I want you to notice that this is abbreviated the governor, Nehemiah, the following priest, dot, 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 the following Levites, dot, 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 the following leaders. We'll get back to that. I want to share with you, you know, last week, um, God's people remembered God's faithfulness. And we talked about this. We talk about this a lot. We talk about looking back in our lives and even when we are not faithful, God is faithful, amen? Thanks be to God. And we think about all these things that, that we thought, I don't know how this is going to work out, and it turns out to be a huge blessing, right? 
only God. And that's where these people are. All these things they've been through, they've, they've realized God's faithfulness. They have realized God's blessing even when they were stubborn and tried to go it alone. Have you ever tried to do that? It never works out. They've learned some valuable lessons by trying that, though. And what I think the most important thing Nehemiah's people learned is that they didn't want to wonder from God ever again. I don't know if you've ever wondered from God or turned away from God, but I had an experience in my life. Um, my then husband uh, <clears throat> had lung cancer and he died. And I was shattered and angry. I was in the ministry, and I could not understand. I couldn't understand what was going on. I, 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 I turned from God. I was so angry at him, and I want to tell you the end result of that. The end result is, is as much as it was sad that this man died, the worst thing that has ever happened to me in my life was turning away from the one who could help me, who could comfort me, who could guide me, who could embrace me, and I went through that by myself. I've learned the lesson that no matter what I go through, I don't want to turn away from God ever again. Let's get back to the story. So you may have noticed that we abbreviated the scripture, and in the full text are 84 very hard to announce names, uh, pronounce, and here are just a few out of the 84 and so, would you like to try? Anybody? 84 of these. So, that's why I didn't read them. Uh, but they're important names. What these names do is ratify this covenant, okay? This made it real. The people of God said, God, this is what we want to do. We promise you. This is what we're going to do. They made a covenant. And this covenant is a term, it's for a contract or a binding agreement. And in the Bible, covenants are promises God makes to his people and his people make to him. God started out the book in Genesis saying, I will be your God and you will be my people. The last book, Revelation says, I will be your God. You will be my people. It's a thread. It runs through the whole book. It's why Jesus came to say, I am your God. You are my people. Come, follow me. It's the whole purpose of Jesus' coming. Covenants were as common among these people as cell phones are in ours. Covenants are all through the Bible. Um, God made a covenant with Noah and Abraham and the people of Israel and a whole bunch more. And David and Jonathan made a blood covenant. They're all over. Covenants were made to secure land sales and loans and peace and, and treaties and, and marriage. With marriage is still a covenant. Did you know that? Did you know, for you married folks, that when you said yes I promised that you were actually promising God and your spouse, but you were promising God. Covenants are witnessed by God. It's a commitment. It's a solemn promise before God. It's written or spoken, and it captures this moment in time that needs to be remembered and upheld forever. Now, the restoration of God's people in their city it's a big event. It's a long time coming. It was fought for. They, they went through so much for this day. And since they didn't have phones, they made promises. They couldn't make a video, so they made a vow. And then everyone gets in on the action. If you're using that photo uh, metaphor that I'm using, it's kind of like we're scanning the crowd right now 
taken a panorama of everyone who gets in on this. It says, then the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the servants, all who had separated themselves in order to obey the law of God together with their wives and sons and daughters and everybody who was old enough to know what was going on here, they all signed their names. It was a big deal, and they promised to carefully follow all the commands, all of the regulations and all the decrees of the Lord. They promised God You will be our God and we will be your people. We'll be your people. Thank you, Lord, for restoring us. And I want to call your attention to the word promise because it's used in here a whole lot. They made promises to God about their homes and their families. They made promises to God about how they were going to do business. They made promises to God about how they would worship. And I want to encourage you to go to the Scripture and read these promises for yourself. And it all culminated in this promise of the people in verse 39. Would you read it with me? We promise together not to neglect the temple of our Lord. So what can we learn here from our spiritual ancestors? Well, I want to offer two reflections this morning and then a challenge to us all. Is everybody still with me? All right. So number one, read it with me, please. When I make promises to God... God uses my promises to make me. What do I mean by that? Well, what if we did the same thing these people did? What if we prioritized our lives, and I'm talking individually and as a body, that God would be first. He would be absolutely number one in our lives. When we place our priorities on God, it makes all the difference in the world. If, if our priority is stuff, if our priority is money, if our priority is, is prestige, all of those things are going to fail us. Only God will not fail us. Where we place our priorities makes a massive difference in this world. And each of us Um, maybe when I was talking about all those special moments in your lives, each of us has special moments. But in the big scheme of things, in the scope of eternity, how much of those things are really going to matter? They're a little blip on the screen. All these things that we think are so important are a little teeny tiny blip on the screen in light of eternity. So what if we had one focus? What if our core values and, and our, our vows that we value the most in our lives were God-centered? Now, Neil and I have each other, thank God, to remind each other what's the most important thing in our lives. You know, when we get, like everyone else, we get caught up, oh my gosh, this rebuild is taking forever, and can I tell you, somebody rear-ended me, and I still haven't gotten my car to the shop to get the quote, and I, you know, I stuff's, none of this is going to matter in light of eternity. When I keep my focus on what matters, those things just fall away, don't they? We'll get to them when we do. It's a big picture. These things don't matter. And then the other thing that that we have to remind ourselves is that we, yes, we live in Lee County. Yes, we live in Florida. Yes, we live in in the United States of America, friends, but we are citizens of the kingdom of God. This is a much higher calling in our lives. He is who we live for. He is who we serve. He is who we desire to follow. He is our God. We are his people. This world is temporary. Our eternal home is heaven. And it's interesting, though, because Jesus, when he talks about the kingdom, and he talks about the kingdom of heaven, in Mark he says the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
And so I, I think about this kind of stuff and study up on it all week. That's one of the things I do for a living. <laughs> and it just makes me think, what if heaven is not only a place but a person, the person of Jesus? What if he didn't come to scare the hell out of us, but to bring heaven to us, to, to help us experience the kingdom of God while we're still here, the kingdom of God. We're a part of it now. And if the kingdom of God is here and we're a part of it now, our promises mean so much more. Now, in Nehemiah's time, the presence of God was only thought to be in the temple. Do you remember that? But who, 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 who is the temple of God today? Where does God reside? What does the scripture say? Don't you realize this is a hard thing to grasp? And oh, if we could, oh, if we could. Don't you realize your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Friends, God does not reside in a building. He resides in you and I, those who have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Come, Lord Jesus, abide in me as I abide in you. You don't belong to yourself, the Scripture says. For God bought you with a high price. That's what this entire week is about. So you must honor God with your body. Hmm. What if we did that? What if we did that? The Holy Spirit lives in you. If we could grasp that and live in that reality. Well, I, I found the words to an old, old song, and we're not going to sing it because it's very traditional. But I wonder what would happen if we started our day like this. Go ahead and put that up on the screen. I'm going to read it, and um, I wonder about promises that we make. Because I've made this promise. I haven't always kept it. But what if we lived into this? Oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve you to the end. Please be forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if you are by my side, nor wander from the pathway if you will be my guide. What if you and I made Jesus the Lord of our heart, or our mind, and our soul, and our body, and our homes, and our businesses, and our relationships, and our marriages, and our loves, and everything? What if we made Jesus the Lord of everything we can think of? What would happen if you and I say, Jesus, I surrender my time and my anger and my internet searches and my cash and my relationships, all of it, to you? What if, what if we actually took discipleship seriously, gave God time every single day to allow him to move in us and reveal himself to us? so we could become who he has called us to be. What would happen? What would happen if this place was unleashed to be the church that God has called us to be? Church is God's idea, by the way. I want to remind you, it's not this. It's us. It's us. And the church has problems, and I know that because I'm in it, but so are you. So, um, but here's the truth, prayed by Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth, but yours. What a holy privilege for us to be able to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Amen. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassionately on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. What a privilege. What a privilege. 
what matters, what really matters right now is that you and I embrace the truth that the Holy Spirit lives in us and then led by the Holy Spirit, we live our lives, we engage in this world in a new way as the hands and the feet and the eyes of Jesus Christ. So this promise, this covenant that you may make with God this morning that I want to serve you. I want you to be my God and I, I want to be your girl or I want to be your guy. And in our homes, that we would covenant together in our families. In the spirit of Joshua who said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord so that your lives are no different here than they are behind closed doors at home. That we're just serving the Lord. We're loving each other and serving the Lord. And how we might engage in this world. How we might engage in business. How we might engage in our everyday lives could be so different. You know, they promised to serve God in their daily life. And, and, and well, here's what I want to say. I said earlier that when I make promises to God, those promises make me. Um, never is it so clear than in a marriage. Because sometimes I don't feel like it. Whatever it is. You know what I'm talking about, right? And I think to myself, I've made a commitment. I made a commitment. I want to be a person of my word and I want to keep my commitments. Promises are powerful. Promises are powerful. And for us, as we deal with the people in our lives, as we deal with our children and our grandchildren, our promises that we make to them can be an island of certainty in a sea of change. There is a lot of change going on in this world, but friends, if you and I would keep our promises, that's going to mean something. Let's read it again. When I make promises to God, God uses my promises to make me. Well, here's our second reflection on today's Bible passage. Things are going to change real quick. Let's read it. When I break my promises to God, God uses my failure to remake me. Truth is, I haven't always kept my promises to God. And by extension then to the people in my life. See, I've got a spiritual highlight reel that I love to talk about. I want to give you, you know, some great testimony and oh, victory in Jesus. But the truth is I've had a lot of failures, a lot of defeats. You know, the promise, uh, the problem with promises is keeping them, right? And I promise God and myself that I'm going to make God my top priority and then somehow he slips in the ranking. Do you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about, I bet you do. There have been temptations in my life that I have said with every bit of will that I have, I promise I will never do that again. See, there's a part of me that wants to live out those promises that I make, and there's another part of me that seems hell-bent on destroying me. This thief steals away the goodness of God, corrupts my will, and then crushes me for the very failure that I messed up in. And says, you're no good, you're not worthy. This is dangerous. This is dangerous territory for all of us if we let those voices speak to us. Because the voice of truth says something quite different. The voice of truth 
says that you are redeemed and restored and that our failures are not final and that God is a God of mercy and a God of grace and a God of goodness who wants to restore us when we fall. Amen. And thank God for that. Amen. Today we've talked about the people of God being restored and renewed. I'm going to ask my friend Adam, wherever he is, to come up here. Um, because God has done something amazing in his life when he became willing to start something new. It is. Oh, good morning. I have made many commitments in my life, but none more important than the vows at my wedding. The vows I made to my beautiful wife, Angie, and more importantly to God as a covenant with God to love, honor, and cherish her. I have not always been successful at keeping this covenant, and for a large part of a decade, I was actually really bad at it. During this time, my life was controlled by alcohol, and I had little or no option to change that. I was a slave to alcohol, and it was my master. Many, many, many times I tried to stop drinking and actually did stop drinking for certain periods of time, but I never changed in my heart and my mind. I was just an alcoholic that wasn't drinking. Then came another opportunity to make a commitment and a covenant with God to actually change my life and to not fall quickly back into a life controlled by alcohol by just stopping for a little while. This had to be a complete life change. It started with detox, then a 45-day rehab, and regularly attending AA meetings. That is where I started to truly realize the enormity of my problem. And that was more eye-opening than daunting to me because I actually had a solution to a lifelong problem. I was coming to the realization that I could not control this alcoholism, but God could and would if I sought him in my darkest times. And after probably two dozen attempts to stop drinking over 30 plus years, I was going to do it the right way with God's help. And in doing that, I was presented with another commitment to service within our recovery group to help setting up and preparing food and coffee for our Saturday night meeting. And when I was asked to do that, I did not want to do it. But I knew I should if I wanted to do all that I could to stay sober and be successful in my recovery. Now I look forward to that meeting and I get to help set up the meeting instead of it being a hassle to me. It is a blessing. In doing these things, I have also been blessed by God to now have 430 days sober. And it seems that every time I commit, a, sorry, and it seems that every time a commitment has been presented to me in my sobriety, and I am willing to make the same covenant with God as a promise to him that I will follow through, my life has only gotten better. On the other hand, my failed commitments have put me where I am today, so God used those failures to also change me for the better. I am grateful for all of this. Another, th- another thing I am eternally grateful for is that Angie also made her commitment to me and a covenant with God with her wedding vows. Because without that, I am not sure if she would, if we would still be together for us to enjoy this new and much needed change in our lives. I am convinced that God put every human being on this planet for the benefit of other human beings and not for ourselves. And if we can remember that on a daily basis and get out of our lives, or I'm sorry, and get out of ourselves, get out of our heads and focus on others, it will only enhance our own lives, our families, and the community around us. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you. So this is Holy Week in the church. I know you know that. We've been announcing it a long time. 
And today, Palm Sunday, we remember that Jesus came into the city, the people were waving palms, shouting, Hosanna, oh, Hosanna! And those very same people, by the end of the week, are going to be shouting, crucify him! Right? The disciples didn't fare much better. Despite their promises, like Peter saying, I will never, never deny you. He fell away. Judas went so far as to betray Jesus. These disciples once made promises to follow Jesus no matter what. And then in Jesus' greatest hour of need, they fell away. They broke their promises. But friends, Jesus kept his. He kept his. He came here to seek and save the lost. He came here to suffer and die for us. For us who break promises. So that we could be shown love and mercy and grace and forgivenesses that our failure would never be final in the eyes of our Lord and Savior. And thank you, God. Thank you, God. So I want to invite you up here if you just want to talk to God about this. Maybe say once again, you're my God. I'm your girl. You're my God. I'm your guy. Help me, Lord. Help me live into that. If you have any prayer needs, just let us know. We have some um, palm crosses up here. If you want to come up here and pray, grab one of those to remember, to mark this moment that you made a covenant with God to be his. That's all he's ever wanted is for us to be his. Let's stand and sing.